la Comisión Superior a Distancia y de alguna otra manera es un parámetro importante en que no es el no nivel nacional sino a nivel internacional. En estos días vengo llegando al equipo de Ecuador representando a la universidad bajo la presidencia de la IESA, de la Asociación Iberoamericana de Personas a Distancia, que es la de eh, Guillermo Carlos, nuestro señor rector, y que de alguna otra manera significa también la importancia de los posicionamientos que es donde ha tenido a nivel internacional. Entonces, actividades como estas, con la visita de los Robert, nos hace llenar de mucho orgullo de tener gente experta en el tema de educación a distancia, por lo que le damos una cordial bienvenida y deseamos que esta actividad sea de mucho éxito y que Don Robert no venga una vez, no una vez, sino dos o tres veces más a pesar de y que la pueda pasar aquí muy bien en esta universidad, la cual tiene las puertas abiertas. Buenos días y un gusto estar acá. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, don Hilda, por sus palabras de bienvenida en esta mañana. Seguidamente, tengo el gusto de presentar al señor Robert Aucoin. Para eso, solicito a don Hilda Castro y al señor Tomaino Barrientos si nos pueden acompañar en los asientos reservados para ustedes. El señor Aucoin es doctor en Educación liderazgo educativo y estudios de políticas de la Universidad de Columbia Británica Vancouver, máster en tecnología educativa y aprendizaje a distancia de la Universidad Concordia Montreal de Quebec, consultor educativo con más de 20 años en planificación, desarrollo e implementación de proyectos de investigación en las áreas de educación, salud, comunicaciones y desarrollo internacional. 25 años de experiencia enseñando cursos en línea y presenciales a estudiantes nacionales e internacionales. Es especialista en monitoreo y evaluación, coordinador de educación a distancia de la Facultad de Extensión de la Universidad de Alberta. Ha ganado varios premios, entre ellos el Premio Maestro del Año de la Universidad de Roger Rhodes nominado para el Premio de Enseñanza Individual y Enseñanza en Equipo, en Ampe Trust Award, Red Canadiense para la Innovación en Educación, Estipendio Estudiantil para la Investigación Doctoral, también la Beca de Enseñanza de Royal Rhodes University con Tecnología X2, Premio Aventis a la Investigación e Innovación en Educación para la Salud, es conferencista en temas de educación a distancia y factores críticos para el éxito en el aprendizaje en línea. Sin más preámbulo, el doctor Aucoy. Seriously, since March, really. 
Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work. Anybody who has tried to organize any sort of conference knows how much work it is. And when you add the complications of bringing in somebody from the outside, somebody from a different country, somebody who doesn't speak the local language, you're dealing with airfare, you're dealing with uh, hotels and travel and all kinds of other things. The logistics is very, very difficult. And so I would like to give a round of applause to Maynard and his team. So, you're going to see me put my glasses off and on a lot. This is called old age. Um, sometimes I can see with them and sometimes I can't, so just bear with me. So, today we're going to talk about the scholarship of teaching and learning, which in some ways is a very new concept, and in some ways it's a very old concept, and I'm going to try to balance both of those ideas. So I'll start with some of the basics that go back to really the 1980s, and some of the newer concepts that really have to do with uh, what I call social media. So, uh, and we'll get to that as we go. Um, I just want a few sort of introductory things. Um, just sort of a, a preface to what I'm talking about. I don't own the copyright for the images in the uh, presentation you're about to see. Uh, and so I want to acknowledge the original copyright of all of those images. Uh, and in fact, the whole presentation, except for the images, is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution. Uh, so I'm not sure if we're going to circulate this afterwards, but I'm okay if, if, the, uh, if the university wants to circulate them. That's fine. Please use them. Please contact me and ask some questions if you like, uh, and, and we can sort of have that as a, as a conversation. The other thing I'm going to sort of preface this by saying, usually when I do sessions like this, I, although it's a lecture, I like it to be sort of conversational, and so if people have questions as I go, uh, they can just ask. In this case, though, I'm not sure how well that's going to work, um, because as I said, I really don't speak Spanish. So um, I guess if people wanted to ask questions in English, that would be okay, but then that might cause some problems. So what I'll do is I'll ask as much as possible for you to leave uh, your questions to the end, maybe note them down and reference one of the slides or something that I said, and then we could have a conversation at the end. The other reason for that is because I think most of you will be attending the workshop this afternoon, and there'll be lots of time for discussion uh, during the workshop. And at the end of the workshop, just as a, a, a teaser, uh, you're going to finish the workshop with the, the beginnings of a plan for your own scholarship of teaching and learning program. So that's going to be exciting. But that involves a lot of conversation, so we'll get to that as well. Um, the other thing that you'll notice as we're moving through the presentation is uh, really I want to use this presentation sort of as a, as a background for discussion, engagement, and reflection. I'm only in country until Saturday, but the internet is wonderful. Um, I never really go away. Um, so you'll have my email address, I'll give it to you in just a minute, uh, and anytime you have a question, Engage your colleagues and talk about it. That's the important part of scholarship generally, and it's really important for the scholarship of teaching and learning. So you need to be talking to each other and communicating with each other. And by all means, bring me into that conversation. Email me. Email me in Spanish, that's fine. I can figure it out if it's text. Um, you know, Mayor, you know, let's have a longer conversation. So even though I'm leaving Costa Rica on Saturday, I hope that conversation is not going to stop. So anyway, so that's kind of uh, what it's all about. Uh, I, I, was, I, mean, I was trying to be funny, but I'm quite serious. I really don't know what was in the introduction. So uh, I don't know how much I should say about myself. So I'll keep it simple. Uh, my name is Robert Lacroix, and I'm Canadian. Uh, I wear many, many different hats, so, uh, and, and have done so over the years. Uh, but basically, my professional life is divided in two. 50%, uh, I'm associate faculty member at a small university in Victoria, Canada, which is pretty much as far west as you can go in Canada. Uh, west is that way for you guys. 
And, uh, but I actually don't live in that city. I live in Ontario, which is 6,000 kilometers away from my university. Uh, and I typically only go to my university once a year, uh, for a month or two. Uh, this year I actually went for three months, but usually I don't go that, that often, uh, because we do everything online, uh, and it works very well. Where it's complicated, of course, is that the time zone changes, because Canada is so big, we have five different time zones. So when, uh, you know, uh, people at my university want to have a meeting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that's 7 o'clock my time. So that gets a little complicated, but it works. The other 50% of my time is spent doing things like this, international consulting. This is my first trip to Central America. I'm loving it. I may never leave. You may have a hard time getting rid of me. Uh, but most of my work uh, up to this point has actually been in Africa. Most of my international work, I should say, has been in Africa and in Asia. So I do a lot of work with teachers' colleges in Zambia, a little bit of work in Ethiopia, and uh, I also teach for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, and uh, that's online as well, but what it means is that my students are literally all over the world. Anywhere where there are populations of refugees, you'll find my students, and so it's, it's, it's a pretty, as I said to Maynard the other night, I, I, I know that I'm privileged, I recognize that, I'm very lucky in the way that my practice, my professional practice has evolved. So I'm very aware of that. Um, so it's great. It's really good. Cool. Okay. Um, I won't say any more about myself uh, because sometimes biographical things about me seep into the lecture anyway. Uh, so I won't say any more. If for those of you who come who are coming on Thursday for the intercultural uh, communications lecture, you'll hear uh, probably way more about my personal and professional life than you want to know. Uh, because it's a big part, it's, it's an interesting piece for me because it really does cover both my personal and professional life. Uh, whereas the scholarship for teaching and learning is, is more on the professional side. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the overview of what we're going to go through today. Uh, a clarification of expectations. In other words, why is this topic important? Most of how I'm going to present this, honestly, is within the Canadian and U.S. context. I'm not sure how much of this precisely matches what you're seeing in Costa Rica, but I suspect a lot of it does. A lot of it has to do with theory versus practicality. So in Canada, if you are hired as a, as a university professor, what they will tell you is that you will be evaluated and your tenure and promotion and so on will be based on the following formula. You will be evaluated 40% on your research, 40% on your teaching, and 20% on what they call service. So service means other. It means serving on committees, it means supervising graduate students, that sort of stuff. Is that kind of what you're told here? Is that sort of what it says in your contract, 40, 40, 20? Something like that? No, not at all? Okay. Good, because in Canada, the reality is nobody is evaluated that way. Nobody. I'm not evaluated that way. Nobody is. What you're evaluated on is, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, you're evaluated on 99.5% research and 0.5% everything else. And so that creates a real problem because, well, especially for me, because I like doing research, and I'm a pretty good researcher, and I have a, I have a, a track record, but I love teaching. I love it. I, if it were up to me, that's what I would just do all the time. I would just teach. I love teaching. I think I'm pretty good at it. I'm passionate about it. I love my students. And yet, not only does that not appear in my evaluations, I can actually be punished for it because I'm doing teaching at the expense of doing research. And so it's a real problem for me and for many of my colleagues. We want to do teaching more. We want to pay attention more to our teaching practice. We want to become better teachers. We can't because we literally will be punished for it. I'm privileged, I'm lucky, partially because I'm old and I've been around for a long time and people don't seem to care what I do anymore. Um, I'm also privileged because I'm only part-time at the university and so I don't fit into the same kind of tenure and promotion tracks as regular faculty. 
But new faculty, and by new faculty I mean anyone up to sort of the age of 35 or 40 years old, they're a bit stuck. I used to work at the University of Alberta many years ago, and part of my job was to work with new faculty members to help them with their teaching. And they would do this as part of the orientation at the beginning of the year. And I'll never forget, the first year that I did this, I went to one of the orientations and I happened to listen to the professor, the woman whose job it was to do exactly what I do, but on the research side. So I was to orient the new faculty on the teaching side, and her job was to orient the faculty on the research side. And in her opening comments, there was a room just like this, and she was standing up at the podium. Her opening remarks, she said, everybody, forget about your teaching. Forget about it. If you're given a course to teach, go in, do the bare minimum, and move on because you're only going to be evaluated on your research. And I was sitting in the audience, I hadn't spoken yet, and I was sitting in the audience and all the blood drained out of my face. I thought, I just, what am I going to say? So the person in front of me just said, forget about your teaching, and now I have to get up and tell them how important and fun teaching is. It was an impossible situation. Later that year, at the same university, the University of Alberta, by the way, is a very large university. It's about 35 or 40,000 students. It's a full university. They have a medical school, a law school, whatever. It's huge. Later that year, there was one faculty that finally admitted and said, when your professors, when our professors in this faculty come up for tenure and promotion, we are not going to look at teaching. It's going to be all research. They admitted it. Wow, I was shocked that they admitted it. Anybody want to guess which faculty it was that said that? One faculty said, we are not going to look at teaching for evaluation. Anyone want to guess? I think I see you now again. No? It shocked me. It was the education faculty. The education faculty that trains teachers devalued teaching to zero. And I just, I was shocked. They did back down on it after about a year, and they brought teaching, well, at least theoretically, they brought teaching back into the mix, but I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely shocked. So that's sort of the, the background for all of this, uh, with the scholarship of teaching and learning. So we were struggling, again, I was at the University of Alberta at the time. We were struggling. If, if our students, or if our students, if our professors are not going to be able to keep teaching as a solid part of their practice, but they want to do that, how can we facilitate that? And the solution was, in fact, the scholarship of teaching and learning. And I'll get into exactly how that worked in just a minute. So that's, that's why I think this topic is so important for me and as part of my own professional practice. So what wound up happening was many profs, maybe not as many as I would have liked, but many profs said, well, if I'm going to be evaluated virtually 100% on my research, why don't I make my teaching part of my research practice. In other words, why don't I investigate my teaching as a research project? And then my teaching will improve. My students will be happy. They will learn better. I'm still doing research, and so I can get evaluated on my research. I can still publish these research projects. And, at least in theory, everybody's happy. So that's what we started doing at the University of Alberta. We had some success. A few years later, I moved to Royal Roads University, which is where I am now. And the scholarship of teaching and learning is a big part. It's a much bigger part of what we do. You'll find, if you check, a lot of the research projects at our university, in one form or another, do involve the scholarship of teaching and learning. Uh, and yet, if you check, as, as Nader and I did the other day, if you check to see where all the publications are in the scholarship of teaching and learning, there's actually very little outside of the United States. The vast majority of publications in this area are from the United States. That's true in a lot of fields I recognize. Okay, so one of the things we're going to do, mostly uh, point two we're going to do this afternoon, but uh, we're going to talk, I'll, I'll show you some slides in a few minutes about how we can or should define scholarship and how it might be different when you talk about small R research versus big R research. So big R research is like uh, when you have a 
formal research program. Think of a, a chemistry professor who has a lab and he's doing regular research programs. That's big R research. Small R research is more like what I do. Things like action research, investigating my own practice, coming and doing consulting projects in Africa, and then building research projects around those consulting projects. That's kind of small R research. But it is all scholarship, it's all part of scholarship. So people need, a lot of the universities don't recognize that. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about this in that in this session. We'll talk about, uh, again, this will come up in the workshop, but how has the nature of scholarship of teaching and learning changed over the last five to 10 years? And I'll give you a hint, the answer is yes. Uh, and what are the implications of that? And then at the, at the end of the lecture, we're going to talk about how some of this stuff works in a digital world. Because when I started this, even when I started, uh, you know, the internet was available, we were doing lots of distance learning, and, and, and you were here as well. But making that connection between education, research, the scholarship of teaching and learning, making the connection between those things and technology and online learning was not there yet. That's quite recent. That's really only in the last four or five years. So we'll talk about that as well. And I'll give you some, some suggestions as to how you can start to form your own digital scholarship and combine that with whatever research you're interested in and your teaching as well. So that's what we'll talk about. How does that sound? Okay. Actually, speaking of sound, I can't really hear myself. Is this okay? Sound good. Nothing worse than getting halfway through a session and somebody goes, we didn't hear a word you said. Okay. So, this is adapted from a, a, an article from 2010. What's the difference between research and scholarship? Um, uh, not an article, a YouTube video. Uh, most of the stuff that I'm going to show you, uh, I've provided references and you can go and check them yourself. Uh, and I've tried to include a variety of, of references from a variety of countries and so on, just to give it a, a somewhat balanced perspective. It's a little bit difficult to do that with the scholarship of teaching and learning, because as I said, most of the work is being done in the United States. And, uh, well, say what you want, but the United States obviously is bias. So it's sometimes difficult to uh, get a balance. But anyway, uh, this is what this, this video is talking about. So there's researcher and there's scholar, and of course there's, you know, they're, not, they're not completely independent. They do connect, right? Just sort of like fingers, they do mesh with each other. So in terms of a researcher, the idea is we're looking for new knowledge. That's the idea of new research. That's why we do research. We have questions. We're, we're curious about things. And we recognize that we have a certain body of knowledge that we're quite comfortable with, but that there's a lot of things that we don't know, and so we want to know, so we go out and research. <clears throat> On the scholarly side, though, the assumption is that knowledge already exists, that it's out there, and our job is to help communicate that knowledge, right? Through teaching, through publication, through knowledge exchange, through uh, sessions like this, and so on. So that's the idea. So there's balance. They dovetail. They're important. You can't, you can't or shouldn't have one without the other. Okay. Researcher. The purpose of the researcher is to generate knowledge, to validate knowledge claims. The purpose of a, of a scholar is to seek knowledge, to become knowledgeable, to acquire knowledge, and possibly to use it in specific contexts. So again, those two concepts are related, but it's sort of uh, two ends of the same spectrum, I guess, is the way they do it. Researchers are often uh, very interested in very specific, they have very specific research interests, uh, they have a very specific focus. Uh, you know, I've worked with, uh, like, last year I had a project at a medical school uh, in Canada, and I was working exclusively in the pathology department, and when I started talking with some of the researchers there about what their research was, interesting, but boy was it ever specific. There was some researchers that were literally examining how certain ions from a chemical would cross cell boundaries, but not any cell boundaries, specific cell boundaries in, found in the liver in certain types of cancer patients. When it takes five minutes to explain just what your little research line is, that's specific, right? And so researchers tend to have very specific research lines that they're interested in. And that's good. 
Uh, scholars, though, are often a little bit more general. I tend to be a bit more of a generalist myself. Um, and sometimes, and I'm, I'm like this, uh, we're just interested in knowing things for the sake of knowing things. We're not always interested in applying research. This researcher that I was working with in the pathology department, although his research seemed very specific, there was a reason why he was interested in how those ions were crossing cell boundaries. Because if you could figure out how the ion was crossing cell boundaries, they could engineer drugs that could attach themselves to the ion, cross the cell boundary, and kill liver cancer. Huge implications in that research, right? My research isn't that specific, and it's, it's not that kind of grandiose and something. So I'm just interested in knowing things for the sake of knowing things. I love learning. It's fun. Um, researchers should, they don't always do a good job of this, uh, share his or her findings with peers in the broader public. Uh, scholars, Tend, we share knowledge, for sure, but we tend to be a little bit more internal. So we'll share things with our students and our colleagues and so on. But on a scholarly level, we're often not writing tons and tons of articles. We're not, uh, we'll go to conferences and so on, but you know, you won't see scholars interviewed uh, by the media because they found the latest cancer breakthrough, right? Whereas researchers do both. So that's kind of how I see that. And then this afternoon when we do the workshop, uh, I'll, I'll get you guys to work in groups and I'll get a sense of how you see uh, your scholarly world versus your research world. So we'll talk about that a little bit more this afternoon. So where did this idea of the scholarship, I'm going to take this off because I'm um, Where the uh, the idea of the scholarship of teaching? Where it really started, uh, this book is, is published in 1990, but the work actually started in the 1980s, was a guy named Ernest, uh, Ernest Boyer, although he pronounces it Boyer, uh, American pronunciation, but it's Boyer. Uh, anyway, he um, was a very senior professor. He passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, and he was very concerned, like I was, about this tension between scholarship and research. And from his point of view, of course I agree with him, otherwise I wouldn't be here. From his point of view, he didn't see those two things having to be separate. You can have both. You can do the scholarship, and you can do teaching, and you can do research, and they don't have to be independent. There doesn't have to be the tension there. You don't have to do research at the expense of teaching. You don't have to do teaching at the expense of research. You can have it all. You can do it all. You really believe that. So he wrote this book. Uh, in 1990 called Scholarship Reconsidered. Uh, it's a very easy read. It's probably been translated into Spanish, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, but even in English, it's a very easy read. It's something you would probably read in an afternoon. Uh, and he lays out the entire plan. It's very, very well written. So I would encourage you, if this is something you're interested in, to pick up that book uh, and have a look at it. Uh, there might even be an online version now that I haven't checked. But the way Boyer, I'll say Boyer, uh, the way Boyer saw this was that scholarship wasn't this kind of esoteric image. And a lot of people did sort of feel that way. I can remember when I was in, in, in undergrad and even doing my master's degree, there were lots of professors who were hired as researchers, or at least they thought they were hired as researchers, and they would fight very hard to not teach. They didn't want to teach. They saw it just as this extension thing that the university insisted that they do and they really didn't want to do it. They would complain, especially if they were given an undergrad course. My undergrad, by the way, is in math and physics. And I was lucky I had some pretty good profs, but uh, a lot of the profs, especially undergrad, like really want me to teach undergrad, like you like they don't want to do that. Graduate level they would consider it, but they didn't want to do it because they saw it just as this extra add-on appendage thing. We have an expression in English that you do something off the side of your desk. Actually, off the side of your desk, and that's the way they saw it teach. Boyer said, no, 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 it's not like that. It's not an esoteric appendage. It's at the heart of what the profession is all about. In universities, that's what we're all about. Yes, we're researchers, but we're also educators. The idea is to generate knowledge and to distribute knowledge. We call it knowledge exchange. That might be our next session when I come back. We'll do a session on knowledge exchange.
So all faculty throughout their careers should themselves remain students. That's the other piece of it, right? I also taught at York University. I've taught everywhere. One of my jobs, 15% of my job, was to do uh, what we called faculty development. And this, this is a long time ago. This is in 1995. And uh, a lot of our faculty members up to that point uh, either were not using email or when they would get an email, they wouldn't look at it. Trust me, uh, no, one's gonna, no one believes me when I tell them this, but it's true. A lot of our profs, they would get an email, they wouldn't look at it. They would get the departmental secretary to print the email off put it in their mailbox, and then they would read the email on paper, write a response in ink. This was 1995. This was not 1895. This was 1995. Write the response, give the piece of paper back to the secretary. The secretary would type the response in and send it. My job was to stop that. So we had computers installed in all of the faculty members' offices, and one of my jobs was to teach them how to do basic computing, including email. And I will never forget walking into a senior philosophy professor's office, and the first thing she said to me, even before she said, good morning, how are you, anything, she said, make this easy because I don't want to learn anything new. And I thought, number one, I'm in trouble. Number two, this is really bad. I almost said to her, and today I would say it, because as I said, I'm old and I'm cranky and I don't care. But in those days, I was young, and I wanted my job. So I kind of went. But what I almost said was, how would you feel on September 3rd if your students in Philosophy 100 showed up and said that to you? Dr. So-and-so, please make this course easy because I don't want to learn anything new. How would that make you feel? I didn't say it. Maybe I should have said it. I don't know. Anyway. Scholars, we've got to be learning all the time, right? Whether it's checking out YouTube videos online or reading books or coming to sessions like this uh, or, you know, writing articles or reading articles or getting involved with research groups, it doesn't matter how you do it, but you need to be learning all the time, right? That's part of who we are. It's part of what we do. So it's very, very important. Uh, and we need to be engaged, especially today because we have the internet, we have social media, we're all constantly connected. You know, I see some of you have laptops, some of you are on your phones and so on. We're always connected all the time, right? That's just part of what life is in 2018. So that's, that's very, very, uh, very important. Okay. So this, I, I do this because on the previous slide, I didn't have the full title. So the scholarship of teaching from this was, this was a secondary article. It was a follow-up from the book. Uh, again, highly recommended. Same author, Ernest Boyer. Uh, scholarship reconsidered priorities of the professoriate. Okay? So again, that's a really, really good reference that I, I would highly recommend. So what we're trying to figure out in the scholarship of teaching and learning, and this, the answer to this question is going to be different for all of us, but basically what we're trying to figure out is, uh, let me get my little pointer going here. Let's do my laser pointer. What we're trying to figure out is we have this discovery piece. If you think about your professional practice, we have this discovery piece, we have a teaching piece, and we have an application piece. Now, the relative proportions of each of those pieces is going to be different for all of us. For myself, teaching is by far the biggest piece of what I do. Okay? Uh, discovery is a pretty big piece for me, but not the biggest. And application, it depends on how you define application. This is sort of application for me, right? I'm teaching, but it's an application. But this, these relative proportions are going to be different for all of you, and you have to decide how you want that. But what we're interested in for the purposes of today and for the purposes of the scholarship of teaching and learning isn't how much time necessarily you're spending on discovery, how much you're spending on teaching, and how much you're spending on application, but how are you integrating all of those three pieces? Or are you integrating all of those three pieces? If you're not, that's okay. Welcome to the majority. Most people do not integrate those three pieces, and that's fine. It's okay. That's what we're going to talk about today and especially this afternoon. That's okay. okay? So that's kind of what we're at. Another way to look at it is this way, as more of a 
rather than an intersection, but more of a progression. I put this one up because this one actually fits me a little bit better. You go from teaching, basic teaching, to scholarly teaching. So scholarly teaching is basically, I've learned this stuff very recently, I'm going to teach it right away. Or I found this event or this idea or this concept through my own research and I bring it into the classroom right away. I'm very lucky uh, that I get to teach quite a variety of courses and one of the courses I teach is called International Relations and Global Politics. And because I get to do international consulting, I'm able to take the research that I do in my international consulting and apply it to that course immediately. And so it, it actually um, surprises the students sometimes because they will, they'll ask me like, can I, can I give them my PowerPoint slides a couple of weeks ahead of the class? And, and I will, but I warn them, when you get on the class, what I gave you might not be the same because there might be something that happened in international relations and global politics that I'm going to incorporate at the last second, and I do that all the time. I taught that, last, that course the last time in January, and when I developed the notes and circulated the PowerPoint presentation, it was November. Who knew in November what was going to happen between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un in North Korea? I did not predict that but it was important to incorporate that into my course because it was a big part of the work that I do and it was a big part of the course. So, I, that, so that's the scholarly teaching. And then that leads to the scholarship of teaching, which I talked about a minute ago. And then you can expand that out, so you can sort of do it in reverse. You can expand that out into discovery, integration, and application. So just a couple of different ways of thinking about it. There is a new piece to this that Ernest Boyer didn't didn't see because it was 1990. So we have the teaching, we have the discovery, we have the application, we have the integration. What he did not see, which I'll talk about more at the end of this lecture, uh, is our presence, our networking, our on life, right? Our life online. I just call it our on life. The other thing which he saw a little bit but not that much is the idea of activism and that goes back to the idea of knowledge exchange. So. The concern with knowledge exchange, and this honestly probably doesn't happen much in this university, but in big Canadian and American traditional universities, what happens oftentimes with researchers is they're, they're in their labs and they're, they're doing what we call grounded research or basic research and they're coming up with information and that's the big chunk of what they do and then maybe they'll go up to the next level and they'll publish a paper which maybe 300 people will read. Maybe they'll go to a conference and another 50 people will hear about it. But it's not getting the mass distribution that it needs. And that's the top level. So I don't want to get into that because that's a totally different lecture. But, um, and so the concern is, as researchers, are we using our research, are we using the results of our research to influence people and people can be defined in any way, right? This fellow in pathology was hoping to influence pharmaceutical companies, other doctors, surgeons, patients, their families, and so on, because he was very interested in cancer research. In my case, I'm usually trying to influence literally people that I meet in a coffee shop, right? To understand things about immigration and what's going on in the world and, and refugees and, and all kinds of interesting things and intercultural communication. That's my audience. But regardless, are people using research to um, influence whatever audience they're interested in influencing, right? Are they able to do that? And again, I'm not sure what the situation is here, but in most Canadian universities that doesn't happen. We do a very bad job of that. We do a great job at collecting basic data information. We do a, eh, an okay job at writing our papers, our academic papers, and then the general public never sees it. And then when the general public criticizes us of living in an ivory tower and saying, you people at the university, all you're doing is talking about dead white men, and you're not doing anything practical, and you're not benefiting the community, and therefore we're gonna cut your budget. When that happens, we go, no, we're doing lots of practical stuff, see? But we, we're not doing it on a regular basis. We're not doing it at a very good time. So that's what we mean by activism. I don't necessarily, you know, when we think of activism, we think about going out on the street with a sign, 
that kind of thing. That's not, in academics, that's not what we mean by activism. We mean using our research and our knowledge and our scholarly activity to influence people around us, to influence whatever communities that we're interested in influencing them. Getting information to those committees when they need it, exactly when they need it. So that's what, we're, that's what we mean by activism. Living online, as probably most of you know, is a really big part of life today, our personal lives for sure. How many of you, though, how many of you, and, and you can please define this in any way you want, but by a show of hands, how many of you live professionally, not personally, professionally online? How many of you have an online professional presence? Put your hand up, I know you do. I know Maynard does, because we chat every day. So about half of you, maybe a third of you, a third to a half. That's actually pretty good. I'm impressed. Because usually when I ask that question, uh, usually my hand goes up, and uh, whoever invited me, their hand goes up, and it's usually maybe just four or five people. So that's great. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. Let me ask the same question, though, personally. How many of you have personal lives online? Facebook? Twitter, WhatsApp. Do you guys use MySpace? Not, so, not anymore, it's dead. Anyway, you know what I mean. So about half, a little more than half, I would say, of you. So that's quite the difference, isn't it? Right? Considerably more of you uh, have uh, personal lives online than have professional lives online. So we'll see if we can change that idea. But living online as a scholar really means to get used to, to enjoy and manage the noise, kind of the unplanned serendipitous insights, the views, the selfies. I still haven't gotten used to selfies. The cats, I love cats, so that's good. The recipes, the insights, fake news, increasing despair, getting used to all that noise and still managing to thrive as scholars. Can we do that? I think we can. It's not easy, though. I, I don't want to pretend for a second that it's easy. It's not. Maynard and I have a, have a colleague um, who I think you're going to meet in September. Uh, his name is Paul. Very nice man. And uh, he, and I'm going to actually show you some slides from his stuff because he's an amazing researcher. Uh, but anyway, he has a very pronounced presence online. And when you talk to him, it's rough. It's like he's in a boxing match sometimes, and people are hitting him. And uh, at one point, about two months ago, Maynard and I were very surprised because he said he was getting off Facebook. He had had enough. People were criticizing him and so on. How long did that last? A day. <laughs> I think he was offline for a day, and then he was back because he realized it was so important to his professional, uh, professional presence as a scholar that he, he, couldn't, he couldn't be off line for very long. Uh, and it wasn't an addiction for him. It was that that scholarly network was so important to him. Uh, that idea of learning and disseminating knowledge was so important to him, is so important to him, he's not dead, is so important to him that he was willing to take the body blows that were coming at him every day. Um, and he'll probably, I, th I think he's coming in September, and so he'll probably talk about that. And by all means, come and see him, because he's amazing. Anyway, so, but, but, again, I want to reiterate, this is not easy, okay? And I don't want to pretend that it is easy. It's not. Well, except for the cats. Selfies are very difficult. Cats are easy. Okay, so living online as a scholar also means being constantly peer-reviewed. This is painful, and it's funny, you know, because... In the old model of doing research, you would write a research article and you would submit it to a journal and it would get peer reviewed. And most of us, especially those of us who are from a research background, whether we have master's degrees or PhDs, most of us are used to that. And even though the uh, criticisms, the peer review comes in and it can be quite harsh, you know, they can come in and say, well, your research methodology is flawed. Uh, your statistical analysis is at a, what, what was one comment I got one time? Oh, his, sup, his, his statistical analysis is very superficial. And I actually know who made the comment because he told me afterwards. But anyway, uh, he was right, it was, it was superficial. But anyway, so 
Some of those comments can be quite harsh, but as researchers, we're trained to take that, usually, positively and say, oh, you know, yeah, the statistical analysis there was a little superficial. Maybe I can do better. Maybe I can, maybe I can keep the superficial part and add some statistical tests to it and that it'll, it'll make it richer, right? We're used to that. We're not used to that, I don't think, on the teaching side. When we get course eval, I got one last night. Actually, it was good, fortunately. But when I get that email saying, your course evaluation for Justice Studies 401, again, the blood drains from my face because, oh boy, what did the students think of me? What are they going to say? Because as you know, students don't hold back. They will give it to you, right? And, and for reasons I'm, I could guess at, I'm not really sure why, we really take it personally. When someone criticizes my research, I take it a little bit personally, but I kind of go, eh, whatever. They're going to help me get a better product. But when someone criticizes my teaching, it's, it's like they're criticizing my children, right? I get defensive. Are you guys like that? Am I the only one? Some of you are like that? Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. And I don't know why, but I talk to lots of other people and they say the same thing. Criticize my research, you know, be nice, but criticize my research, no problem. Please don't tell me anything about my teaching. Right? I don't want to hear it. So, so we got to get used to that because now living online as a scholar means that the feedback, the peer review that we're getting online is starting to look like the peer review we get in our teaching. And this goes back to the, my friend Paul that I was telling you about. It gets personal now, right? And it's rough. It's not easy. It's upsetting. I've lost sleep over this, right? I've been criticized publicly on my Facebook page online. You know, Robert, you don't know what you're doing. You don't, I mean, I'm making this up, but you, you, you don't understand the theory. You, you, you took the wrong theory and you applied it to the wrong context. What were you thinking? And it's very personal because they preface it by saying, Robert, it's not anonymous anymore. So it's really rough. If you can get past that though, if you can, as, as Paul does, if you can take the body blows, if you can do that, then again, you can come up with a much better product. Your teaching will improve, your research will improve, and so on. But it's hard, it's very difficult, right? You're having your views questioned and tested all the time. You probably have a Spanish expression that's the equivalent of this, or maybe you even use the English word, but when you're on Facebook and somebody posts something uh, a little bit controversial, maybe it's a, an article that's in favor of something Donald Trump did, or any article about Donald Trump, and suddenly everyone attacks you. In English, we call that flaming. How do you call it in Spanish? Same, I don't know, maybe you don't have an expression. You're getting flamed, it's like, it's like everyone's attacking you with a flamethrower, and they're just like shooting at you and stuff, and it's really quite aggressive. Um, but again, if you can get through that, if you can get used to that, then hopefully you can engage those people in a conversation and and the end result will be so much better, okay? It goes in the other direction too, of course. But anyway, I'll come to that. Living online as a scholar also means taking risks, negotiating the impact of every facet of your being. This will come up again on Thursday in the intercultural communication session. It means negotiating the impact of your race, your gender, your geopolitical location, your institution, your class, everything. I run into a lot of problems because the bulk of my, again, I'll talk about this on Thursday, but the bulk of my research now is in international relations, intercultural communication, uh, language ac acquisition, uh, working with international students. And when people see my stuff online, they kind of go, well, this is really interesting. And then they see me and they go, uh, you're a middle-aged white guy from Canada who appears to be unilingually English. I'm not. I actually speak French, too. And you're talking to us about gender issues? You're a middle-aged white guy. You're talking to us about gender issues. Where is your credibility? And I get that all the time. In the old days, that might not have shown up so much. Online, people know immediately. They know immediately. They just look me up. Robert O'Quan, and they see a picture of me. Oh, he's a middle-aged white guy. Really? He's talking to us about gender? This guy has no credibility, 
right? So it's the whole thing is really different. And so now you're negotiating these things in a much more public way, right? Um, these, these issues, again, I'm, I'm not sure how big these issues are in the Costa Rican context. We'll talk about that on Thursday. Uh, but in the Canadian context, which is a very multicultural society, it's a big deal. It's a big, big issue. So um, again, though, and, and again, I don't want to pretend this is easy. It's not. It's very difficult. But if you can negotiate that, if you can move through that, then the end result is so much better. Okay, so I want to jump into a little bit more deeply about this idea of digital scholarship, some considerations about things that you can do about digital scholarship, your presence online, activism, and so on. Um, and one of the things that I want to emphasize, actually, let's get rid of this. There we go. Uh, that everyone, I think, understands implicitly, but no one ever really talks about, is that um, when you're doing your research online, what you're doing is you're building networks, you're building communities, and that's great. And, and in my research, we talk about communities all the time, and, and uh, you know, communities and networks are often seen as this kind of warm and fuzzy thing. Oh, it's nice, I'm part of this community, we all love each other, and it's great. But what we don't mention is that when you do that, when you build those networks and you build those communities, by definition, they include people and they exclude people. And as scholars, we need to be aware of that. We're very good at identifying and recognizing who we're including, but who are we excluding? back to the issue of when I do lectures and research about intercultural communication and we start talking about things like gender and I get criticized. Fair enough, I get criticized oftentimes by feminist researchers and they'll say, well, you're a middle-aged white guy. To try and join those networks for me can be very difficult because I'm excluded, right? And it goes the other way as well. Oftentimes you'll see uh, different types of networks that will implicitly or explicitly exclude women just based on their gender. Oftentimes it's not done intentionally, but if you, it, it's changed quite a lot now, but when I first started in the field of educational technology back in the 1990s, and you would go to a conference, there were not very many women, right? A few, but it was literally 95% men. Is that a coincidence? Maybe, but by creating that network, we were excluding women. It's, it's balanced out a little bit better in the last 15 years, but, but at the time it was a real challenge. So always remember that. When you're creating these networks and these communities online, you're not just including people, you're excluding people. And even though they might be excluded, they could still be affected by the decisions that you make. Whoops, sorry. By the decisions you make and by the way that you do your own activism. So just be aware of that. So let's look at this kind of historically. This is a picture from the uh, Ontario Historical Society from about 100 years ago, 1914. What, just kind of call it out. What do you, I know that picture's not great and it's not very big, but what do you notice about that picture? What can you say? Just scream it out. Hombre, is that what I see you mouthing? No? Maybe not. Try, try, trying to read lips in Spanish is really hard when you don't speak Spanish. What do you notice about this picture? Just anything. Anything at all. I saw someone doing this. The hats. Everyone's wearing hats. Yeah? That's important. Why is that important? Yell it out in Spanish if you like. That's right. There are a fair amount of women, surprisingly number, a uh, large number, but compared to the number of men, not that many. It's mostly men. I want to go back to this hats idea because I think that's really important. What does that tell you, that they're all wearing hats? What do you think that might tell you? Maybe... 1914, you're wearing a hat. What does that say about you? Today, if you wear a hat, it just means you want to wear a hat. Or maybe it's sunny outside, or it's rainy outside, or something. Affluent. Affluent. It means you've got money. 
You were considered part of a higher class, and you were meant to wear a hat to, to show that, to show that you were part of high society. So these were the kinds of networks that we were dealing with 104 years ago. So they included, but they excluded as well. So this was quite different, right? In those times, in pre-digital times, who you knew mattered. It was not, you know, oh, I'm an expert in educational technology or I'm an expert in the scholarship of teaching and learning. It was who you knew. Can you introduce me to this person? This was pre-networking, pre-digital pre networking times. A lot of these networks were what we call old white boy networks, right? So if you were a woman, if you were a person of color, again, I'm talking about the Canadian and, and American and European context, but if you were, uh, you know, if you were a woman, you had to work hard to get part of these networks, right? I think it's a little, I hope it's a little easier now. Disciplinary connections, gatekeeping, journals, all that sort of stuff were absolutely critical. If you were applying for research money in Canada up until very recently, it was very important who you knew. It, they weren't even doing double blind uh, research proposals for grant money. So people would, you know, some professors would get up in the morning and they would get, you know, $100,000 grants to do anything they wanted to do. New people, like myself, didn't matter what I wanted to do. They didn't know who I was. I wasn't going to get research grants. I wasn't going to be welcomed into those types of uh, scholarly environments and those networks and so on. Institutional reputation and networks were really important. If you were a professor at the University of Toronto, you could pretty much be guaranteed a really good, supported, well-supported research program. If you were a professor at Royal Roads University, which is where I am now, uh, they would say, what, what is Royal Roads University? They had never heard of it. So who you were, where you were, your background, those things were really, really important. Legacy privileges and drawbacks, race, gender, class, country of birth, those things were absolutely critical, uh, and so on. Social gatherings, uh, water fountain meetings, and so on. Those, those things were really, really, really important in pre-digital times. This was how you built your networks, right? You met somebody on the train that you recognized as working in your department or working in your university, and oh, hi, how are you? What do you do for a living? And, Oh, you're a researcher too. What are you researching? And, and, and it's kind of serendipitous. Nowadays, you, that still happens, of course, but there are other ways to build those sorts of networks as well. So what's changed? Well, all the stuff that I just showed you is still in play for the most part, right? I, you know, Maynard and I met at a face-to-face -face conference in October, right? We've continued our professional relationship online, but that initial meeting was face to face. So all of those factors are still at play, but there's an added layer now because of the digital nature of scholarship. So all of that stuff is still there and it's amplified. I'm not sure if this session would happen in a pre-digital time. I try to think through this. Okay, so Maynard and I let, met last October at a conference in Toronto. We went and had a couple of beers and we talked about research and that sort of stuff and realized we had a lot of things in common and, and, and it was great and we really had a good time. In a pre-digital era, I wonder if it would have just ended there. At that point, what am I going to do? Write him a letter in ink or type it and send it to him and it, and it might get here and it might not and he's a busy guy and he's got a million things to do and he sees this letter among many, many, many other letters. What are the chances that he's going to respond? He might. But you know how things happen, right? There's, there's, especially after conferences, there's this high level of enthusiasm that drops very quickly. But in a digital environment, that still can happen, but it tends to get amplified. So you have this high level of enthusiasm, but it's even higher, and then you can maintain it longer, right? So I'm not sure this, would have, this event would have even happened in a pre-digital time. But in, in a digital time, it has happened, and I think it's been great. So it's been really good. Related to that, of course, we now have lots of social media. The ones that I, and I'm going to show you some examples in a minute, but Twitter, Facebook, blogs, LinkedIn, and so on. Um, in a networking, in a digital environment, we're now recognizing and nurturing weak and strong connections. Uh, 
Don't underestimate the, what I call the serendipitous weak connection. About 18 months ago, two years ago, I was at a conference, and I'm a consultant as well, right? So that's half of my practice. So when I go to conferences, th this sounds awful, but there's a part of me that's kind of trolling for contracts, right? And, and so I'm at this conference, I'm in Malaysia, and I'm trolling for conferences, uh, for contracts. I'm talking with people and, you know, what are you doing? Is there any opportunity for me to get involved? And so on and so I'm doing that. I left the conference with a stack of business cards like that. And I was bored. So I actually ordered the cards top to bottom from the group that I thought was most likely to result. This, I know this sounds awful. You must think I'm a cad. From the group that I thought was most likely to give me a contract to the group that was least likely at the bottom. When I got home to Canada, this was November, I started emailing them, starting from the top, going to the bottom. When I got to the bottom, I was tired. This had gone on for a couple of days. I was tired. And I remember talking to my wife, and I, I literally only had two cards left. And it was like the end of November. And the bottom card was this guy from Zambia. From a ten and I lived in Africa. I've worked there a lot. I know the place very well. I had never heard of this town. I had never heard of his college. Like, they were, they were out there. And so that's my bottom card. And I thought, and I even said to my wife, I, there's no way anything's going to happen. I'm not going to email this guy. And she said, you know, it's close to Christmas. Email him Merry Christmas. OK. Dear Philip, it was a real pleasure meeting you at the conference. I just wanted to say hi. Merry Christmas, Robert. Six months later, I've got a two-year contract with his college in Sulawesi, right? He was the only one that actually came through. Talk about serendipitous. I almost ripped his card up and threw it away, right? That contract, I mean, again, I'm picking on Maynard a little bit, but Maynard hears me talk about this guy all the time because he's so amazing. He's so amazing, and the work that we do is amazing. And if you want to talk during the break or this afternoon about it, I'll, I'll bore you about it because I just go on and on and on and on. It's an amazing contract, and we're doing a lot of really exciting research and scholarly things at this college. But it was totally serendipitous. I almost threw the man's card away. Don't throw cards away, OK? You don't know what's going to happen. It's very impossible. Uh, yeah, it's impossible. It's impossible to predict what's going to go in the future. I'll tell you this cute little story that I always tell my students and I'll try and do the, I'll try and give you the quick version. There's a Chinese, it's actually a Taoist story about a farmer, a very very poor farmer and all he has in his whole life, his wife died, all he has in his whole life is this little dirt farm and he has one son and one horse and one day his horse runs away. Have you guys heard this? Maybe you've heard this story. His horse runs away and now he's in trouble. And all the villagers come and they go, oh, you poor man, your horse ran away. What are you going to do? This is terrible news. And he says, maybe. So the next day, he says to his son, look, the horse probably isn't that far away. Go and find the horse. So his son leaves and he goes and he finds the horse. Not only does he find the horse, he finds nine other horses that don't belong to anybody. So he brings all the horses home. Now they have 10 horses. So I wouldn't say they're rich, but they're better off. And all the villagers come and they say, wow, this is great news. This is so lucky. You have 10 horses. This is wonderful news, isn't it? And the farmer says, maybe. The next day, of course, these are wild horses. So the son has to, they call it breaking the horse. They have to break the horse in so that they can domesticate them and use them. And so he does this. And of course, if you've been around wild horses, they're big and they're dangerous and they can be nasty. And he, one of the horses throws the sun, and he hits the ground, and he breaks his leg. All the villagers come, and they say, this is terrible news, isn't it? And the farmer says, maybe, OK? So anyway, the long version of that story goes on for about 15 minutes. But the point is, is that it's very difficult. These types of serendipitous uh, uh, events and actions and communications and so on, you just don't know what's going to happen. By the way, the next stage, I should give you one more stage in that story. The next stage in that story is that the next day the military come looking to recruit young men for the military and they're going to go off and have to fight a war. And they look in in the sun and of course his leg is broken, so they leave him. Good news, isn't it? Maybe. 
we don't know. It's very difficult to, to predict the, the future, right? And that's a really hard lesson. And I, and I, and I lecture people like yourselves that, you know, you, sh you always need to be careful about this stuff. And yet I'm the worst offender because I nearly ripped up that business card, right? It's very hard to do that. Okay, so be aware of those kind of serendipitous, weak connections. Also be aware of filter bubbles. And, and again, I lecture you on this as if I'm an expert in it, and yet I make the mistake all the time. When you're on social media, especially Facebook, I find Facebook is particularly bad at this, when you, and YouTube as well. When you start looking or searching for certain types of things, what you'll find is the next time you log into that site, it'll reinforce. So let's say you're a fan of Donald Trump. For academic discussions, let's say you're a fan of Donald Trump. And so, to, or maybe you're not, I don't know. But anyway, but let's say for whatever reason today, you go onto YouTube and you do a search for Donald Trump. And so you'll get a bunch of videos. And if you go onto Facebook, you'll get a new, bunch of news articles about Donald Trump. And you get what you want and that's it. And then you close the computer down and you go home. The next day, when you turn your Facebook on or when you go to YouTube, what's going to pop up? Articles about Donald Trump. It's checking your past history and it's creating a filter bubble for you. The excuse that Google and Facebook use is they, they're trying to customize your searches to make your life easy. And I appreciate that because it can make your life easy, but it can also envelop you in a bubble and so you never, so you become Trump obsessed. You never get to see what um, uh, Hillary Clinton, but that's not who I'm thinking of. The, the other guy, the, the old guy that was going to run against him, Bernie Sanders. You never get to see anything about Bernie Sanders because Facebook just thinks you want to see stuff about Donald Trump. Right? And that happens in scholarly literature as well, right? Uh, particularly in, in, in fields that can be a little bit controversial, things like gender studies, race studies, class studies, and that sort of stuff. You know, a lot of times, especially in Canada and the United States, there's kind of a left-right balance. You know, are you, on the, are you on the political left or are you on the political right? And you can get trapped into these bubbles very easily, and that's just the way the technology is designed. But that happens in our personal networks as well. I mean, I know people who, are, for example, uh, very uh, left politically, right? So not socialist, but they're kind of actually left for you guys, left that way. They're left politically, and so they won't hang out with conservative people because it, it will break their bubble. Literally, it'll break their bubble, and they're, and they're not comfortable. That's way outside their comfort zone. Well, that's fine if they want to do that. But as scholars, I think that's dangerous. I think we need to be bursting those bubbles uh, personally, like we're doing here, and also online. So just be aware of that. If you, if you notice you're getting the same kinds of results in your searches all the time, clear your browser history and see if something else comes up. The other place where filter bubbles shows up, and, and I do this experiment with my students, a lot of my students are uh, from mainland China. And so when I teach with them face to face, we do an experiment. We get my laptop and I get their laptop and we sit at a table right next to each other. And we open up Google and we type in Tiananmen Square, 1989, but we don't hit enter. We ready? We hit enter at the same time. Boom. On my laptop, what shows up is Tiananmen Square, 1989, the tanks rolling in, I get YouTube videos of the, uh, the government crackdown on the students, June 4th, 1989, some of you probably remember this, right? Lots and lots of people were killed in Tiananmen Square. That's what I get. My Chinese students, when they hit enter, they get the museum in Tiananmen Square is open Monday to Friday, blah, blah, blah. they get tourist information. They get absolutely nothing about the disaster from 1989, nothing. Why? We're right next to each other. We're using the same internet connection. We're not in China. We're in Canada. We're using the same browser at exactly the same time, and our results are completely different. It's because of filter bubbles, okay? So they're engineered. Sometimes they're engineered by the technology. Sometimes they're engineered by the government. Clearly, in the case of my Chinese students, they bought these laptops in China. They were using them in China before they came overseas, and so there's stuff in there. 
One thing I never tried, I should try this, is have, uh, have them clear all their cash and their cookies and stuff and see if that helps. I should try that next time. But anyway, just be aware of that because that's really, I mean, that's always been an issue, those filter bubbles, even before the digital age, but it's so much more of an issue now. Okay. Get some water here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to combine all this stuff now. Virtual spaces, physical places. Virtual spaces, as I said, includes things like lists, serves, groups, Facebook, social media, that sort of stuff. Uh, the interesting thing about that, of course, is in, when you're using virtual spaces, it allows us to be connected 24-7. That's good, that's bad. You have to learn to balance that. Some of you probably are subject to this. If you have kids, your kids are certainly subject to this, but how many of you are lying in bed at night with your phones. You don't have to tell me. I, I almost don't want to know. Having your phones lying in bed 11, 12 o'clock, 1 a.m., whatever, right? Okay, I'll display my bias. I have a problem with that. Put the phones down, go to bed, talk to somebody, read a book. But anyway, whatever, that's me. I'm old school. So there are advantages, though, to being connected 24-7. My students love that they can have access to me 24-7. When I was flying down here on Saturday, I had posted a note, because I'm teaching two courses online right now, one for the university and one for the United Nations, and I posted a note, I guess on Thursday, to tell them that I was not going to be available on Saturday and Sunday this weekend. And they were shocked. Like, I got emails. I mean, they were nice about it, but they were, I could see, like, I would get emails back from them and, and postings on the forum and saying, you know, have a good trip, uh, where are you going? <laughs> like, like, are you leaving us? Like, what are you doing? So I, I had to explain to them, well, I'm going to Costa Rica for a week, but starting Monday, I'll be back online. Everything will be good. It's only two days. You guys will be fine. Everything will be okay, right? Take a day off, do that. But they love the fact that they can get a hold of me more or less 24 seven. And I encourage that probably more than I should. Um, whereas in physical spaces, that's, that's impossible. We can't do that, right? We have lives outside the university, we have families, we have kids, we have other things that we're interested in. It's just not possible to do that, right? So how do you balance all of that, right? So that's, that's a challenge. There's a really, uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys have, have read this book. It's actually getting a little dated now, but I thought it was really interesting because this is another way that you can expand your networks in terms of this scholarship of teaching and learning idea. And you can do this face-to-face, uh, -face, physically, and you can do it digitally. But basically, try to connect yourself to the connectors. And I know this is a little bit arrogant of me, but I really think that I'm a connector. I love connecting people. Right? That's a big part of what I enjoy doing. But find out who, and it might be you, actually there's probably a good chance it is you, but find out who in your organization are the connectors. Who are the people in your organizations that just seem to naturally know everybody, they know what kind of research they're working on, they know what courses they're teaching, they know what what uh, people's interests are outside of work and so on. I suspect you're, you're a connector, aren't you, Maynard? I think you are. I get that, as we've been walking around campus since yesterday, I get the sense you, s I'm amazed at how many people you know. Um, this fellow that I work with in Zambia is definitely a connector. When we're walking somewhere in this town, if it's a 15 minute walk, we have to leave 30 minutes ahead because every person on the street stops, to, stops him and has to talk to him. And it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely, unless you're in a hurry. You cannot be in a hurry with this man because everything takes forever, right? So it's great. But find out who the connectors are and connect to them. And please, include me in that, okay? Use, if you feel that that's appropriate and you're, you feel comfortable doing that, include me in your, in your connectors. Please do that. Um, but anyway, so this comes from Malcolm, Gl Malcolm Gl Gladwell, who's a Canadian, but he's based in the United States. Um, there are certain people who seem to be really good at spanning different worlds as well. They, maybe they're multilingual, maybe they research in different areas, uh, maybe they've found this nice balance between teaching and learning. Uh, sorry, yeah, well, teaching and learning, but I'm in teaching and research. Um, they're there, those people, oops, sorry, those people are there, I guarantee it, okay? 
combination of their personality, their curiosity, their self-confidence, their sociability, social ability, I guess, and energy. They have their feet in different worlds and they have the ability to pull these worlds together. Those people are out there. I suspect that most of you, just by virtue of sitting here in front of me, are probably connectors. Without ever having talked with hardly any of you, I suspect most of you are connectors. So enjoy that and go connect to other connectors and encourage people who aren't connectors to connect to you. Start doing mentorship. Find out what junior faculty are interested in in terms of research and teaching. Make the initial move. Oftentimes there's a power dynamic where it's junior faculty, junior staff, junior researchers are scared to death to approach a senior person. I always tell my students, because um, I, I, especially since they're international students, mostly from Asia, they're very shy and they, they don't like to rock the boat and they won't ask me questions. And I always tell them, look, if you see me in the hall, come and talk to me. Even if you just talk about the weather, I don't care. Come and talk to me. If you see me sitting, and I don't have an office, so I'm, if I'm working, I'm in the cafeteria. If you see me in the cafeteria, come and talk to me. Come and sit with me. Have a tea with me or a coffee with me. If it looks like I'm busy, I'm probably not. I'm probably just bored and I'm checking Facebook or something. Come and talk to me. And they do. They start to do that. And it spreads because one student will do that. One very brave and scared student will come up. I don't bite. They think I do, but I don't. They'll come up and talk to me and then guess what? We're in such a public space that other students will see, oh, David went and talked with Robert and he's not dead. Robert's not yelling at him. He's not throwing things at him. He looks happy. And the next thing, they'll come and talk to me. And it grows, and you build those networks, and it's amazing. It's such a pleasure for me when I think about the number of students who graduated or haven't taken courses from me for years, and they are still in touch with me, right? I got an email just a couple of days ago from a student who I taught several years ago. She just got a really interesting job in her field, and she was so excited, and she wanted to include me in that. that right here. That nearly brought me to tears. I love that, right? But you have to make that initial move to build those networks. Do it with your students, do it with your colleagues, especially your junior colleagues and your senior colleagues as well, okay? Don't be shy. Again, I'm saying that as if it's easy, and I know it's not. I'm fine getting up in front of you guys and talking for hours and hours and hours, no problem. Get me down there one-on-one, -on -one, suddenly I get a little bit quiet, right? So I know it's not easy, it's not easy. Connect to mavens, this is, ra this is not ravens, but mavens, this joke makes more sense in English. Um, mavens and connectors are related, but they're not quite the same thing, okay? A maven is a Yiddish word for somebody who accumulates knowledge. Do you ever, I bet most people in this room are like this, but do you ever meet someone, they're like a Renaissance person, you can talk to them about anything. You can say, did you watch the, so the football game yesterday? And they'll go, yeah, the guy used such and such a play. It was really, really interesting. And you'll talk for a little while. And then you'll say, what about the volcano in Guatemala? And he'll say, yeah, you know, the science behind this is really interesting. And this is the same person. And then, you know, what about the civil war that's going on in Syria? Yeah, you know, there was a news article. Have we all met people like this? I think we've all met people like this. Probably a lot of us are like this. I try to be like that. Those are mavens. They seem to just know a lot about a lot of different things. They seem to be very well connected. They read a lot. They're very aware and so on. Connect to those people. Find out what their interests are. Find out how their interests connect to your own interests and build your networks, including those people and around those people. And then you can use that as part of your scholarship of teaching and learning. You can build research projects around that. You can improve your teaching around that. And it's really, really powerful. Okay. I'm gonna give you some really specific examples of, of things you can do. Uh, some of this stuff you're probably already doing. This will just be a little bit more organized. Uh, but things that you can do to be a digital scholar and living your life, living your on life. Uh, this is a book out of South Africa. Again, I, I recommend it. 
I um, can't remember what year. Oh, 2015. I, I knew it wasn't that long ago. Uh, Goodyear, and I think that's pronounced Zernovitz. Uh, Academics Online Presence, a four-step guide to taking control of your visibility. This is the third, third edition. It's out of South Africa. These authors are at UNISA, which is one of the largest uh, online institutions in the world. Um, uh, University of South Africa, it's a fantastic institution. Highly recommend that book, and it's free. Just click on it, free download, and it's, it's, uh, it's a really good read. Uh, and it talks about a lot of the stuff that I'm going to go over just now. Remember that, um, this is going to sound really negative and I don't mean it to, uh, remember though that when you're online you are having yourself a digital footprint and there's, like everything in life, there's good and there's bad with that, so you need to be aware. So I have this kind of weird um, sentence, the informed and the intentional actions we take leave a mark. They leave a mark, we know that. When you post something onto Facebook, when you post an article onto Facebook or you have a publication, we know that leaves a mark. We know that people read that. We know that people will comment on that. If you go and watch a YouTube video and you scroll to the bottom, you'll see sometimes thousands of comments. We know that we leave a mark. We leave a footprint. What we may not realize, though, is that the uninformed and the unintentional non-actions we take also leave a mark. Okay? The stuff that we're not doing, the things that we should be reacting to and we're not reacting to, says something. Okay? So if you see, and I'm not going to give any specific examples, but if you see an injustice on the street, in your department, in your classroom, online, and you don't react, that leaves a footprint as well. So your actions leave a footprint and your inactions leave a footprint. And I know that sounds really heavy and really negative and I don't mean it to, I'm just saying be aware of that, okay? And that's the nature of digital scholarship. That's the nature of living online. Everything counts now, much more than it used to, and it's amplified. Okay. Um, also remember that we have digital shadows. That was digital footprint, but we also have digital shadows. When we have a presence online, people are tracking us. Either human, non-human, robots, and so on. Um, it's actually quite frightening. Some of the privacy rules uh, that I'm starting to see coming out of the United States and Europe are actually, some of them are good, some of them are quite frightening. If you were following the news a few months ago about uh, Facebook and, um, what was the name of that company? They were actually, Cambridge Analytica, and then there was a third company which has since folded, which was actually based in Victoria, which is where I teach. Uh, and I don't know if you were following that story very closely, but basically they trolled data from Facebook, and what they did was completely legal. No one ever said that they did anything illegal. It was completely legal what they did, but it was also completely unethical. Because what had happened was, is when you uh, would go onto Facebook and you'd see this really cool app, and it would say, log into this app or join this app or whatever by using your Facebook credentials. Now that app had your Facebook credentials. And Cambridge Analytica, because of the way the law worked and because of the way the, the policies were set up, they were able to create their own app, suck everyone's data from Facebook because people were logging in from Facebook, and now they have all your personal data. And then they were able to use that to make political decisions in the Brexit uh, referendum a couple, two years ago, I guess, and also during the, uh, the last uh, US presidential election. Totally legal. Legal, not illegal. It was legal. They didn't do anything legally wrong. Ethically, very bad. Legally, no problem. Facebook has said that they've since changed their privacy uh, guidelines, so that shouldn't happen anymore, but they've lost a lot of trust. I don't know how far that's going to get pushed. There was another example, actually, this is, oops, sorry, I keep doing that. I apologize for that. Um, there was another example that happened at the conference um, that where I met Maynard last October in Toronto. One of the keynotes was a guy from uh, England. Uh, he's, I guess he was the president or the CEO of FutureLearn. Has anybody heard of FutureLearn? No. So FutureLearn is a private company that was created to do MOOCs, massively open online courses. And what they did is they, had a, they developed a partnership with um, the Open University of the UK, which is one of the largest open universities in the world, and a partnership with the BBC. The man started his presentation, this was the keynote address, by saying 
Through our partnership with the Open University of the UK, we were able to get all of the personal student data from every student that's been at the Open University of the UK, I think they said for the last 30 years. And we were able to use that to populate our own database. And then he moved on and started talking about how they were developing courses. And I was sitting there going, wait, stop, wait, 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 wait. Did you just say that the Open University of the UK gave you 30 years of student data? I didn't say this to him, it's a keynote address, you're not supposed to interrupt, but I was thinking that. Again, my inaction, I should have acted. But that's what I was thinking, did you actually just say that and then move on as if it was nothing? And he did, I checked with my friend, did he just say that? Yeah. Did he say they got ethical approval? No. Did he pay for it? No. Was there anything in the Open University contract that said that while you're applying for a program in 1977, it might be used 30 years later, your data might be used 30 years later, was there anything in there? No. Uh, I kind of have a problem with this. They, no one in the room reacted. No one. Just, yeah, 30 years of student data. We're talking about probably 200,000 students all of their data points. We're talking about millions and millions and millions of data points. No question about whether it was ethical or even legal. So just remember that you are leaving a digital shadow. Be careful. Again, I know I'm being very heavy and I'm sounding very negative. I don't want you to, uh, you know, throw your laptop and your phone away and go live in a cave. Don't do that. Don't wear a, don't wear a tinfoil hat, right? Don't go crazy. But just be aware that we're all in this together, and some people don't always have your best interests at heart. So just, just be aware of that. And, and I hope no one goes home and loses sleep over that, because that's not my intent. Uh, anyway, okay. So a couple of really practical things. Some of this, uh, you're probably, some of you are doing this, some of you are doing some of this, probably none of you are doing all of this. LinkedIn. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Excellent. LinkedIn, honestly, it's not as good as it used to be. Uh, it started out as a, as a social media to try and build networks so that people could get jobs. Uh, I actually find that part of it doesn't work very well. But the idea of building networks of like-minded people, of people who are interested in the same sorts of things, actually it works pretty good. Um, so if you're not on LinkedIn, I suggest you, I, I recommend you check it out. It's pretty good. Um, because I maintain quite a nice network in there. And by all means, if you are on LinkedIn and you want to link to me, please do so. Um, I, I strongly encourage that. So that's one thing that you could do to start building your scholarship of teaching and learning network. Okay. okay. Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? Ah, I thought so. Okay. I'm not even going to bother asking the next question. The next question was going to be, how many of you are on Twitter personally and how many of you are on Twitter professionally? But only about four people raised their hands, so I'm not going to ask. I have to admit, I have a love-hate relationship with Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I, I post like once a year or something. Um, not very often at all. I, sh I need to be more active because Twitter can be a very powerful tool when used correctly. The complaint I hear about Twitter often and I'm guilty of this complaint too, is that some scholars say that Twitter doesn't work for them. And in a way, that's sort of like walking into a library and saying, like expecting the books to find you and expecting the information to find you. You have to be, if for Twitter to work for you, you have to be an active user. You have to be posting things. You have to be posting articles, photographs, and so on. So we should be doing a live Twitter feed of this session right now, and we're not. Um, you have to go and find your networks. Who is it that's on Twitter that's posting things that you find interesting, that are related to your work? Either your research work or your teaching work or a combination of, of that. I guarantee those people are out there. And, it, and if you get in there, it won't take you very long to find them. Twitter has a very bad reputation now, of course, because the only time we ever hear about Twitter is you know with the Britney Spears of the world and the Donald Trumps of the world, it always seems to be negative, 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 negative but it doesn't have to be, okay? It can be a very positive environment, but, but you, have to be, you have to be active. It, it won't happen naturally, okay? So using Twitter as a scholar, as I said, requires effort, dedication. Uh, you have to be very careful about who you follow. Uh, 
you know, what, what is it like, even though the person is an educational researcher, they may not be posting stuff about educational research. So you need to actually look at their tweets to see what it is that they're posting. Okay. Uh, but you also have to be willing to deal with what we call noise because there's a lot of noise in Twitter, right? There's a lot of things that uh, you're not interested in, things that you probably don't want to see and so on and you just, you just have to deal with it. And again, it's not easy. Facebook, probably no surprises there. But how many of you use, I, I think I already asked how many of you are on Facebook and there's quite a few of you. How many of you use Facebook professionally, like for your research or your teaching? Let me see again. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, I again, I kind of have mixed feelings about this. So I use, I, most of my Facebook use is personal, but I do use it professionally. I'll post articles there. I'll post uh, interesting things that I've found in my field uh, and so on. I encourage uh, former students, not current students, but former students to join me on Facebook if they like. So I have quite a few former students and will interact uh, scholarly uh, all, all the time. The way I do it, and this is just a personal thing, uh, current students and former students, if they want to contact me on LinkedIn, that's fine. They can do it right away. If they want to connect with me on Facebook, they have to, they can't be a current student. They have to have finished their program. And then, and I'll accept. Any, any former student, if they, if they ask to connect after they've ceased being my student, I will always say yes. And so it's, gr it's a great way to stay in touch with them. Why? Sorry? Why? Why? Again, it's personal, but it's because in my Facebook, I post some things that I don't want current students to see. Like pictures of Maynard and I splashing around in a waterfall on Sunday. <laughs> Basically, that's why. Whereas when they cease to be students, uh, I, that doesn't bother me as much, right? Good question, though. Yeah, but that's just my personal decision. You know, you you would decide for yourself how you'd want to do that. But anyway, Facebook is a very powerful tool. Uh, it's still like the fourth largest community in the world, right? There's China, India, Russia, or Indonesia. I can't remember which is next. And then I think it's Facebook and the United States. It's the fourth largest community in the world. So if you can tap that as a resource, as a scholar, that's an amazing potential. Obviously, you're not going to reach 4 billion people, but you certainly will reach more people than in a regular academic journal. Right? So Facebook used correctly can be great. Um, the problem with it, of course, is like everything else, that line between your personal and your professional life is going to get a little bit blurry. And so depending on your comfort zone, you're going to have to be careful with that. Okay? I am getting more comfortable with that. Um, a few years ago, I wouldn't have allowed any students, former or current, to join me on Facebook. I just wasn't comfortable having them see pictures of me swimming around. Um, I'm a little bit more comfortable with it now, um, just because I'm a little bit more used to it. So you need to decide what your comfort zone is. And don't make that decision on your own. Talk to your colleagues in this room. Do you use Facebook? Ask them. Do you use Facebook? Do you allow former students on your Facebook? Do you allow your professional colleagues on your Facebook? In Canada, there's lots of people who will not allow their colleagues, their work colleagues, on their Facebook. I know lots. In fact, I was one for, for years. I wouldn't do it. You want to be connected to me? We're working together. LinkedIn, that's where you'll find me. Facebook, that's for family and friends only. That's not true anymore. Okay? So don't make that decision on your own. Talk to your colleagues. Have that conversation and see, see where you want to go with that. Okay? And that, that decision will be dis different for everybody. Okay? Okay. Uh, blogs. How many people here have a blog? I know blogs are getting kind of old. You do. Yeah, a couple of you. I know they're getting a little bit old, but I still think that they're powerful tools. Uh, they're easy to update, uh, and you can try stuff. That's one thing I like about a blog, because my research, probably this is true for you too, a lot of my research is in different stages of completeness, and sometimes I'm not quite sure where I want it to go. And so sometimes I'll put stuff on a blog or on my website or on Facebook and invite feedback. And, I'll, and sometimes, actually frequently, people will go, you know, Rob, what you're doing is interesting, but have you thought of taking it in that direction instead? 
or maybe expanding your, your intercultural research to include that group, or maybe going the other way, instead of trying to look at intercultural research that includes language, culture, food, gender, instead of doing all of that in a single research project, maybe you should chop it up and see what that's like. So I always get really good feedback that way. Um, because sometimes, honestly, I'm not sure where my research is going until I get there. And so probably most of you are like that as well. And blogs are a really good tool for that because you'll get feedback through the comments and through email and so on about, about what they think. Uh, the one, uh, the tool that I use for, there's a million tools out there for blogging, but the one that I use is WordPress. Uh, it works pretty good. Um, I wanted to give a little plug for Paul. This is how he does his because um, the other nice thing about blogs is if you use, uh, if you use it through Blogger, uh, which is the Google product, then you can get Google Analytics and you can see who's checking out your blog, how long they're staying on your blog, which articles they're reading, uh, where they're from. Uh, depending on how it's set up, sometimes you can have their name so you can know what institution they're from. Google Statistics is... Uh, uh, is great if you're into things like learning analytics and that sort of stuff. So, so there's a lot of really, uh, really interesting things uh, about that. And then, of course, if you look at this slide, you, oftentimes this stuff is connected through Google Scholar. Um, so one thing, uh, particularly for the researchers in the room, that I highly recommend if you're not already doing this is Google yourself and then save that Google search through Google Scholar. Save that search and then you can see when people are, A, reading your articles, you can see when people are referencing your articles, and then that's really important. So you can see how many times in a year somebody has, has written an article and put in a reference to one of your articles. And that's really, really powerful because when you come time to uh, come up for a promotion or maybe a different job, you know, maybe you're applying for a different job, you can present that and say, you know, I wrote this article and 100 people last year referenced this article in, in their articles. And that's, that's actually a really powerful tool. So I highly recommend that. And you can connect all that to your reg regular articles as well as your blogs and so on. You can't really connect it to Facebook, unfortunately, but blogs you can. There's also something called SlideShare, which uh, I haven't used, but I'm going to start using soon. Um, when I do these types of present, I haven't used it because I don't do tons of these presentations, uh, but I'm doing more and more now. So I'm going to start present, um, posting like these presentations to SlideShare. Then it becomes open, open access and people can look at it. And of course your name is still attached to it so they can still reference it. It's like a publication, except it's not a written article. It's, it's your presentation. Right? So you can post anything up there, guest lectures that you're doing, regular teaching that you're doing, just things that you would like to have circulated and have people know about. Um, because it's a problem, you know, um, it used to be in scholarly environments the only way people could get to know you is through your research. Because you're teaching, you're only teaching to students, it's only a few people. Um, and But now, now there's so much more that you can do. Okay. Um, that's Google Analytics, I already showed you that one. There's also something called ResearchGate. This is a, a, a really good tool as well for people like me who uh, start doing research projects and then kind of start to question the research project and they sort of go, maybe I shouldn't be going in that direction, maybe I should be going in that direction. ResearchGate allows you, I think they call them preprints, they allow you to publish articles before they're really finished. Uh, and get feedback on them. They call it a preprint. And uh, again, you get that amazing feedback from other scholars saying, you know, I think that's a really good direction you're going, but maybe you should also include the following. So ResearchGate is really powerful. It's, I believe it's out of Germany, but it's very, very accessible uh, to all languages and it works really well. And then of course you get, uh, there we go, you get statistics about it as well, so you can check. So 8,000, this is not mine by the way, uh, you get 8,715 people reading, 49 of those were just last week, 539 people have cited your articles, anything that's up on ResearchGate, 18 of those were last month, four people have recommended you, none this week, and then you can see it as a graph as well, okay? So you can track basically your popularity uh, on ResearchGate. Okay, let me just wrap up with some kind of final reflections. 
Um, you, have, you have to listen. Talk, I said this at the beginning. Talk to each other and listen. What are people interested in doing? What kinds of communities do you have here? I mean, you have a big community. What kinds of smaller communities do you have here? Right? How can you work together? How can you start to combine your research into smaller groups? I mean, it's great that you have a research center, but as individuals, what can you do? And how can you combine that with your teaching? Right? How can you make those things connect? So talk to each other and listen. Listen carefully. Let people tell you what they're thinking. Because as we know in research, sometimes, especially if you're like me, I'm a little bit long-winded, if you start with this little germ and you let somebody talk, whoops, sorry, it, it blossoms very quickly, right? But if you don't listen, then you'll never reach that stage. So do that. It mean, being a digital scholar means to be an audience. So be each other's audiences. Talk to each other. Listen to each other. Find out what they're doing and, and, and give each other feedback and, and show care. Care for each other. Um, remember that because everything is online now, things get amplified quickly, okay? And sometimes we're not ready to deal with that. But be prepared. Be ready for that. Be open to that. Be open to sharing. Be open to the criticizing. Uh, excuse me. Be open to the criticism. Um, you know, call attention to things, right? You may not have even written it, but see, when you see things online that you think would be of interest to your networks and to your students and so on, share that with them. Um, that's what scholarship is all about. Don't forget, though, that especially us, the people in this room, the people at this university, more than anybody else on the planet, we have a duty to be critical, but to be ethical, okay? If we are not ethical, who on this planet will be ethical? You know, I always say this to my students and to my colleagues at the university when we get into really uncomfortable discussions and inevitably someone will say, we shouldn't be talking about this. You know, this is not an appropriate discussion. And my response is always, if you cannot talk about this at a university, where on earth can you talk about it? We need to be talking about these things, but you have to remember the ethics, right? So you need to be ethic ethical. You need to um, honor people's privacy. Uh, if they've given you certain uh, elements of data, of personal data to be used in the classroom, don't use it in your research. They have not given you permission to use it in your research. You need to use data and information ethically. Okay? Um, so you need to know when not to share. You need to know when you can share, when not to share, when not to repeat, when not to amplify. So I'm constantly asking colleagues, you know, I'll see something of theirs, uh, maybe online or something, and I really like it, and I'd like to maybe post it to Facebook or maybe actually steal a couple of their slides and incorporate it into my presentations and so on, and I could do that like that if I wanted to, and no one would know. No one would question it. I always ask them, always, and I always give them credit. Okay, it's, it's really important to do that. Right? So, and, and again, if we don't do that in the university, no one's going to do it. So just remember that. I know that's kind of heavy too. It also means supporting each other, applaud each other, right? There's brilliant people in this room, there's brilliant people at, that, at this university. Applaud each other when you have successes. If somebody does write something that's really clever and really interesting and really powerful, tell them. Tell them that you think it's great. Be positive about things, support each other, care for each other, and so on. Because it can be really scary. The digital world can be really scary. So let's, let's uh, all be in this together. When I first got involved in online learning, one of the reasons that I loved online learning was because of the intercultural piece. And, and you know, in the old days, before online learning, it was very difficult for some people to come and access especially higher education, right? If you were blind, it's not easy to negotiate a university campus when you're blind. If you're in a wheelchair, uh, if you are a single mom with four kids, uh, if you're working full time, um, if you're deaf, all of these uh, cultural factors really made it difficult for people to study, especially in, at, at universities. Online learning, in some ways, 
erased all of that. And so I always used to say that one of the beauty, and I still say, one of the beauties of, one of the wonderful things about online learning is that when you're online, nobody knows that you're a dog. You could be a puppy out there and, you know, might not be good, but you don't really know that the person is a dog. I had this course years ago I was teaching. I used to teach a course called Technology and Society, and the course was a face-to-face -face course. But I would, in the middle of the course, I would do two weeks online using Moodle. And I would just tell the students, for those two weeks, you, you go online, uh, we'll have the discussions online. If you want to do your discussions at 3 o'clock in the morning from a coffee shop, you do that. You do not have to be in class at the regular time and so on. Just the same sort of stuff that you guys do. Most of my students in that course were from mainland China. And when I get mainland Chinese students, they often don't use their Chinese names. They have nicknames. So we're in the middle of the two weeks, and there's this one student who's consistently posting brilliant, genius postings, like in-depth. Like She would post things, and I'd have to look stuff up in the book like genius stuff and I did not recognize her name so I went and I checked who is this person I went and checked and it was a girl named Phoebe her nickname was Phoebe now Phoebe in class I did not know what this girl's voice sounded like she would sit in the back of the room maybe look at her phone never say a word I did not know what the girls and I thought it can't be the same girl. So I checked again. It was her. It was the same girl. She was a genius. I got mad at her. After the two weeks, I went up to her and I said, you've been holding out on me. Those postings were absolute genius and I don't hear a word from you in class. You're moving up front and we're talking. And she got better. She got more comfortable. But the point was is that her personality was completely different online. She was a different person online than what she was here. You know, so that, that's so I used to say that, but now because of things like Google Analytics, because of Cambridge Analytica, because of Facebook, it can go the other way, right? Now on the internet, everybody knows you're a dog. They can track data. They can find out who you are. So we do need to be a little bit careful about that. So it can, it can cut both ways, right? So there's a certain anonymity on the internet, but then there's a certain uh, revelation as well. So anyway, so you need to understand about our digital footprints, our shadows, and so on. Understand the choices that we make. Sometimes they're irrational. Uh, sometimes they make a lot of sense. We have a lot of options on these things. But it's, we're trying to always predict what's going to happen down the line. And don't forget the Chinese Taoist farmer. Oh, this is wonderful news, isn't it? Yeah, maybe. It might be. But to try to predict things down the line in the future is very, very difficult. I'm not saying don't do it, just be careful and think about that, right? So what are you posting? What, is, what effect is that going to have down the line? This seemingly very innocent article that you might post to your Facebook page might have ramifications down the line. They might be good ramifications, they might be negative. Just be aware of that, that's all. I tease people about this. I actually did this. Going dark or offline, I, I, it's increasingly impossible. I just don't think it's possible anymore in 2018. I closed my Facebook account in 2016 uh, because I was sick of all the negativity uh, and I stayed off uh, for a year and then I kind of got sucked back in. I felt like I was missing out on a lot of the network things and I was missing out on family things and friend things so I came back in. I, I, I mean again this is my opinion, I just don't think it's an option anymore. So we need to understand what's in our control, what's not in our control and so on. So you need to sort of weigh the risks and the opportunities. Okay? It's, it's a dangerous world out there, but I think if you play it correctly, it's, it's, it's worth it. I'm just going to finish up uh, with this quote. I really like this. Roxanne Gay is a, is a poet. Um, I think she's from the United States. Uh, I'm not fearless. I'm terrified, but I write anyway. I pretend no one's going to read my words, and I try to make sense of this world that's so breathtaking and beautiful and complicated and hideous. I love that quote. There's another uh, quote that's related to this, and I actually, it was a friend of mine at the University of Ottawa, it was the first time I heard it, he said, in a digital world, in a digital scholarly world, so that means research and teaching, if you're not afraid, if you're not scared, you don't understand what's going on. 
right? So again, I know that sounds really negative, but don't forget wherever there's, wherever there's danger and wherever there's conflict and wherever there's tension, there's also opportunities. And so that's what we do as, or we should be doing as scholars. And in fact, we're gonna talk about that this afternoon when we do the workshop. What are those opportunities as scholarship and of teaching and learning professionals and as digital scholars? What are those opportunities for us? How can we do this together as a team? What are our individual roles and responsibilities? And what do we think or what do we hope the outcomes are gonna be? I'm gonna end there. Questions? Oh. Oh, thank you. Don't ask any questions yet. It's going to take me a while. <laughs> ah. Actually, if you do it in English, you can ask questions now. Oh, yes, and we have a microphone somewhere. Yes, please. Bueno, muchas gracias a, al doctor Aucón por, por su conferencia. Eh, ¿Alguna pregunta para pasarles el micrófono? Thank you, Professor, for your interesting speech. Uh, I was wondering, um, I'm, I'm, I have experience in the field I'm researching, but I'm a very new researcher. Okay. And, um, uh, oh, sorry, Sebastian Fournier from production. Um, That's okay. So I was wondering, when you're doing research that is linked to political things that are happening. So sometimes you need to speak out about what you are researching. Yes. And when you are sharing part of what you are doing with other people to see how it goes, how do you do that without having issues then about pre-publishing your work? So how do you deal with the information that is important to be shared publicly mm. before publishing, yeah. but knowing that that can damage your publication in the end. Yeah, so that's a real challenge. Um, and, and basically, I would go back to this idea of, of building your own little research networks, particularly if you're a junior researcher. Um, so it's really important to have these networks. If you look now, yeah, so that construction is a little distracting. But um, if you look now, when I, when I first started in this business, and probably a lot of you as well, when you, when you got a journal article and you look down the table of contents and you saw the titles and the authors, usually most articles were written by one person. When you do that now, when I, like, uh, there are certain journals that I, that I go to by default, and I look at the titles, very few of them are written by one person now. They're almost always in teams. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is, is that the sum is greater, uh, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, we, we build off of each other and we, you know, you bring certain things to the research that I would not see. And then I bring things to the research that you would not see, and so we, we benefit that way. So that's the main reason we do it. But the other reason which is really powerful, because you mentioned political issues and things that could be sensitive, the other reason you want to do that is because there's a little bit of safety in numbers, right? If you can get into a network with some senior researchers who, A, are, they're not as worried about, you know, dealing with sensitive subjects, B, they have the experience to know how to deal with sensitive subjects, and they know the language that you need to use to deal with those sensitive subjects, you will learn very, very quickly from those senior researchers. So it goes back to finding your connectors, finding your mavens, and that sort of stuff. That's a really good question. Thank you for that. Good morning. Thank you. In, in, uh, don't speak English. <laughs> eh, entonces, hablar en español. <laughs> eh, bueno, mi nombre es Roxana Morales, soy investigadora acá en la UNED. Y primero, dar las gracias, darle las gracias por visibilizar a una persona, un profesional, un investigador, un ciudadano comprometido. En palabras de la pedagogía crítica, una persona con conciencia social. Y eso es necesario y relevante 
sobre todo en los tiempos actuales. Porque cuando una persona docente es humana, tiene un enfoque humanizante e integrador, nos interesa todo lo que acontece a nuestro alrededor. Y los tomamos como preguntas generador, generadoras, método Pablo Freire, y me encanta ese enfoque esperanzador con ética, y me recordaba a la pedagogía de la esperanza de Pablo Freire, que es un, un texto en el cual se articula exactamente... Oh, I, bueno. I know Paulo Freire. Ah, sí. Yeah. Eh, usted habla de integrar, yo hablo de articular, teoría práctica. Yeah. Y eso es lo que necesitamos precisamente, articular la teoría, articular los contenidos a la vida, a la vida cotidiana. Y en nuestro medio universitario, yo por muchos años fui docente, y hay algo que sí existe y es palpable, y creo que la mayoría de los que estamos acá, cómo integrar la investigación con la docencia. Y en nuestra realidad inmediata sabemos que eso es muy, muy, muy difícil. Administrativamente, si no nos dan carga académica, es muy difícil investigar. Entonces ahí viene la otra parte, si yo estoy en la docencia, si soy una persona comprometida y el enfoque que tenga de investigar, yo estoy permanentemente investigando. ¿Por qué? Porque estoy observando, porque estoy preguntándome, porque estoy cuestionando, porque tengo criticidad, no, criti no criticona, sino criticidad. Y allí es donde los modelos didácticos que tengamos como docente, también estamos enseñando y aprendiendo a nuestro estudiantado. Y yo creo que eso es lo que tenemos que ir rompiendo esquemas, tenemos que ir haciendo rupturas de cuál concepción de investigación en la que estamos practicando. Y de allí hay algo importantísimo que es transformar sobre mi práctica, transformar sobre mi práctica educativa, profesional, el quehacer académico en general. Muchas gracias. Humbled to be mentioned in the same room as Paulo Freire. Um, I, I wouldn't say I, I'm a Paulo Freire scholar by any stretch, but I've certainly read some of his works. And honestly, until you just mentioned it, I hadn't considered how much I was influenced by him, but you're absolutely right. Those connections between community and our research and our teaching, um, I think we're part of the original conception of a university 100 years ago, and somewhere along the line, at least in Canada and the United States, we've lost it. And I'm hoping we're going to bring it back now. So, you know, more, more power to you. Congratulations to you. And, and thank you for that comment. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. More questions? By the way, uh, I, I know. Whoops, sorry. I keep doing that. I know people are a little bit shy, and it's and you're and you're tired, and it's hot, and you probably want to go, and I don't know. Um, that's okay. For those of you coming back for the um, the workshop, there'll be more time to talk. Um, and and I always tell. I usually say this to students. Um, but you know, if you're a little bit shy, if you have a question, uh, but you're a little bit shy, you know, stop me. Tell Maynard you want to ask me something. Send me an email. Uh, I'm usually really, really fast at responding to emails, so you know, don't be shy. Uh, but then the other thing I'll say, which I usually only say to students, is there's, there's a disconnect between your hand and your brain. And so sometimes when I say to students, do you have any questions, you'll see this and they'll go, wait, no, I can't ask a question. I'm not smart enough to ask a question. And you'll actually see them fight. The, the brain, the hand wants to do it in the brain and they'll fight. And I'll say, don't, don't, because usually what happens is, and you, you know this as teachers, you all know this as teachers. When somebody asks a question and they're all nervous, most of the people in the audience will go, yes, I'm so glad they asked that question, because I was thinking the same thing. So, based on that, are there any other questions? Did I make anybody feel better, or did I make you feel worse? I think there's going to be one more question. 
uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm going to ask you in Spanish. Okay. Um, nosotros, bueno, formamos parte de una cátedra de matemática aquí en la Universidad Estatal a Distancia. Eh, usted mencionó anteriormente que daba clases de matemática y física, entendí. Eh, ¿Cuál fue su experiencia o qué, digamos, qué consejo le daría a los profesores de matemática de esta universidad para apoyarse, digamos, en las tecnologías y todo lo que usted ha conversado con nosotros hoy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's, it's, um, it's a real challenge. In fact, we were just talking about that yesterday at lunch. Um, what's most important, so there's a couple of pieces to this. From a pedagogical point of view, what's most important is that you uh, uh, use a variety of tools. So I teach many, many courses online uh, for a couple of different institutions. And what I'm always trying to do is use a variety of tools, a variety of activities, and, and a variety of assessments. And I, and I do that for a number of reasons. Number one, just so my students don't get bored. Uh, but number two, because I recognize that students learn in different ways and they also demonstrate their learning in different ways. And so you need to give a variety. So for example, I teach a, a, research, a, a research methods course online. It's a fourth year course and part of the, um, part of the assessment is to do uh, a research, not a research paper, but like a, an essay, a critique. And part of it is to do, there's a final exam, which is online, and then part of it is to do a presentation. And invariably, I will get students saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine at doing the presentation, I'm fine at doing the paper, but I don't really do well on the exam. I'm not comfortable with doing exams. But then I'll get other students who say, just why can't this course be 100% exam? Because they all have different ways of learning and they all have different ways of demonstrating their learning. So use a variety of tools. Use the ones that, that you're comfortable with. Figure out what your colleagues are using as well and try and connect in with them. Um, and see what your students are doing. Check with them. I mean, I, I, you, you may have noticed this with your students as well. Recently, I, I've noticed it. Um, my students really aren't using email very much anymore. Um, in fact, the only person they email is me. Um, it's old. It's old technology for them. Whereas I still like using email. There's something about it that I really, really like. So, you know, find out what your community is using. I, I'm not sure, did I kind of answer your questions? You can follow up if you like. Okay, sure, yeah. Buenos dias, mi nombre es Susan Solis, de la Escuela de Ciencias Sociales y Humanidades. Eh, bueno, gracias, profesor, por por su visita y el compartir esta experiencia. Me queda muy grabada la imagen de, este, de esta, esta imagen histórica que usted puso la fotografía. Y siento, eh, hago una reflexión rápida y eh, sí, qué interesante el rol de la mujer que actualmente está incorporada más en estos procesos académicos pero siento que todavía estamos luchando, ¿verdad?, algunos académicos y, y bueno, más si estamos insertándonos, iniciando, tratando de desarrollar alguna, bueno, como, como aspirar a tal vez desarrollar alguna línea de investigación, tratar de posicionarse, que eso ya sería pues un nivel bien, bien elevado y es complejo y toma sus años. Pero sí, eh, me he sentido, ¿verdad? Me he sentido en estos procesos de que todavía seguimos en esta lucha de esas altas posiciones, de estructuras, de académicos que ya se han posicionado con temas y vemos eh, revistas que se han posicionado y que sí, a veces buscan la calidad, pero cuando uno quisiera eh, exponer o escribir en esas revistas, le ponen a uno tantos, no sé si criterios, o aspectos que en la medida de lo posible uno hace todo ese esfuerzo y a veces hace la reflexión de santos cielos, me estoy alejando de mi, tal vez no de mi tema, pero que sí me están obligando a ser parte de esa dinámica y no me dejan con cierta libertad. Entonces ahí es donde usted, no sé, usted nos dice, cuando hacemos estas redes, 
inclu eh, incluimos gente y excluimos gente. A veces como académicos queremos ser parte de, pero quizás es muy caro o cada académico tiene que hacer su reflexión de qué tanto voy yo a, 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 como, como a eliminar. No sé si me estoy haciendo un rollo, profesor, pero <ríe> es esta reflexión que me genera. Usted es un académico ya posicionado, ¿qué piensa usted sobre estos grupos eh, con estas revistas especializadas? Eh, ¿Usted qué piensa al respecto, verdad? Porque, bueno, usted ya es, un, sigo insistiendo, un académico ya posicionado con su experiencia y vemos unos que estamos tratando de, pero que sí vemos que sí son muy fuertes en esa exclusión y ellos no escatiman como en tener como esa libertad de decirle, no, si usted tiene esta posición está bien, eh, eh, expóngala con, 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 con su contexto, ¿verdad? Entonces, no sé si me entendió, es una reflexión que hice, no sé si me habrá entendido. Gracias. Eso es maravilloso. Y sí, estás bastante correcto en todos los puntos que has hecho. Es un real challenge para las mujeres, a veces, particularmente las mujeres jóvenes. Um, and unfortunately, there are no easy answers to this, but let me present some thoughts. There's a story, this story may or may not be true, but I like to think it's true. In the Boston Philharmonic, which is a huge orchestra, quite well known, they had a disproportionate number of musicians who were men, professional musicians. Uh, like. 90% or more were men. And they decided, this goes back a few years ago, they decided that it, it, you know, it should be roughly 50-50, 50% women, 50% men. And the question was, how can you do that fairly? Because you can't just say, I'm going to take you because you're a woman. What if you're a terrible musician? You can't do that, right? So what they started to do, they started to realize that there was probably a bias there, and so how do you get rid of that bias against women? So what they did is they started doing uh, their auditions behind a screen so that the people judging the musicians couldn't see the people who were auditioning for the position. And it, the, the proportion went from 90% men to about 70% men, which is better, but still not right. It should be statistically about 50-50, right? So then they said, well, what's going on? Why is it only 70, 70, 30? It should be 50, 50. Does anybody know why? Anybody want to guess why it was still unbalanced? The people in the reviewer in the audience could not see who the musicians were. Why was it only 70%? Turns out that when men come to do their auditions, they wear shoes like this. And when women come, they wear shoes like that. And when you walk across the stage wearing shoes like that, you can hear. So then they said, aha, when you audition, you have to take your shoes off before you come across the stage. And so they did that, and they got 50-50. Now, that story may not be true, but I've heard, enough, I've heard it often enough from different people. I'm, I like to believe that it's true. The point is that, that those biases are so ingrained in our brains, they're part of what I like to call our lizard brain, the part of our brain that goes back a million years, the part of our brain that is the same as what a lizard would have. Those types of gender biases are very, very, very old, and they're very ingrained in our brains, in our culture, in all of our social structures. And so, because they're so uh, deep, it's hard to get rid of them. It really is. So, back to your thought. You said, you know, what about specialized journals and, and specialized networks and stuff? Yes, I would totally encourage you to do that, um, but perhaps as a, as a short-term measure, because you don't want to be excluding people too much. So, if there's, for example, um, a group of women on campus who can form a, a woman's only research network, I'm not quite sure what you'd want to call it, or a research group, do that. I really encourage you to do that. And in the short term, what that'll do, kind of like the first question, it'll give you 
uh, the experience and the power and the knowledge and the language so that you can gradually break into the larger uh, research society. It'll give you the confidence that you can do that. And people will start to recognize it, right? Because as in your group, you'll start to publish in various journals, and then the people who have, are in positions of power at the university, they will start to recognize that. Again, though, I'll always preface this by the same, saying the same thing. It's not easy, and it's not going to happen overnight, right? So this, this will take years. You know, I'm sorry, I know that sounds very negative, but to change those types of structures and those attitudes is not easy. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And, and, and you know, I'm looking at you, I, I see a leader. I think you need to be the leader on this, right? What do you think? Say yes? You'll do it? Okay, good. Uh, two more questions. Quisiera preguntarle sobre un tema que estoy investigando sobre el papel de las nuevas tecnologías en la educación a distancia. Eh, hay una actitud muy usual entre los tutores y profesores en ver a la educación, eh, las tecnologías como en educación a distancia como lo más novedoso, importante, pero me preocupa cierta ingenuidad que puede haber en esta actitud. Este, eh, ¿No cree usted que deberíamos ver también un enfoque crítico ante las nuevas tecnologías? Por ejemplo, lo que está ocurriendo con la este, brecha digital, ¿verdad? que un sector muy pequeño tal vez está creciendo muchísimo en el uso de las nuevas tecnologías, más deja a un gran sector de nuestro país, de nuestra sociedad, fuera del el alcance de las nuevas tecnologías. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. Honestly, I've, I haven't looked at that much from a research perspective. But where I have looked at it a lot is from a teaching perspective. So that's, again, the cross, sort of the cross between um, teaching and research. I used to teach a course, uh, unfortunately, they canceled it. Well, the same course I mentioned before, Technology and Society, where I did two weeks online, but the rest of the course was face-to-face. -face. And the course was basic. everyone thought it was a computer science course. It wasn't. It was a sociology course. It was about how we influence technology, and perhaps more importantly, how uh, technology influences us and how things progress. Um, I'll give you an example, and this is, this is uh, maybe I can, oh no, I can't, I'm not connected to the internet. I'll have to ask you to visualize this in your head. Um, the very, very first bicycles back in Victorian England, 150 years ago or something, if you can picture what those looked like, with the very big wheel in the front and the tiny little wheel in the back, right? When, when people today think about bicycles, what they think of is, oh, what an amazing technology. Anybody can afford a bike. It's easy to use. It's great transportation. It's very green. You know, no one complains much about bicycles. They're great. But if you look at those early bicycles, they weren't like that at all. In order to have one of those bicycles, think 150 years ago in Europe, a couple things, and I, use, I lead my students through this to take takes much longer with them, I'll just tell you guys. The, the wheel, the front wheel, was as tall as I am. So in order to ride one of those bikes, you have to be in good shape to just get up there. Plus, those bicycles, the first ones, the wheels did not turn. So you have to be an athlete to do this, to turn. They had no brakes, so to stop, you have to kick your foot behind the wheel, and as it slows down, you have to jump from my height. So you have to be an athlete to ride one of those things. You also have to be rich, because those bicycles are very expensive, and a regular person can't afford one. You also cannot be a woman. Why can't women, European women of 150 years ago, ride one of those bicycles? Why not? Dress. Remember the dresses? You've seen pictures of them? Very 
There is no woman, I don't care how good a shape you're in, <laughs> there is no woman that is getting on one of those bikes wearing one of those dresses. It's physically impossible. So you have to be male, you have to be rich, you have to be in really good shape. It wasn't a technology for the masses at all. It was very elitist at the time, and yet the technology has changed. My point is, is that it's really important to investigate how we influence the technology. So we influence that technology by saying, hey, why do you have to be, you know, why can't women, why can't you invent a bicycle that a woman could ride? That seems very unfair. So lo and behold, we have bikes that women can ride now. Why can't you build a bike that's affordable? Why do you have to be rich? So lo and behold, we now have bikes that are reasonably affordable and so on. So that's a question of society influencing technology, but we also know it goes the other way around, right? Technology, a lot of the technologies we use today, especially the online technologies, influence the way we operate. So when we were all young and we wanted to watch a movie, we'd come into a room like this and we'd sit down and they'd project the movie up there. Now we all sit in a chair and we watch our movies here. Or here. So the technology has influenced the way we consume media. So it goes both ways. So, sorry, and I actually have forgotten what your question was, but, but I think it's really important for your research to critically examine those things. One thing you may want to check uh, is if, if, from the sort of theoretical framework perspective, a philosophical framework perspective, is the Frankfurt School of uh, Philosophy, which actually goes back to the 1930s. They talked a lot about the public space uh, and how technology could affect the public space. Of course, they were dealing with very old technologies, but you might want to check some of that, some of that research out as well. I don't know if I answered your question. If, if not, please feel free to follow up. I have the last question. Sí, buenas. Eh, para mí, la parte más importante es el problema administrativo, porque creo que aquí en Costa Rica y en América Latina la investigación es elitista, pertenece a un grupo y cuando en la universidad hay un grupo que se le permite investigar, más bien quieren alejarse de la parte de enseñanza. Usted mencionó un poquito al principio acerca de esa situación, pero resulta que el profesor más bien no se le da espacio, él no quiere dejar de enseñar. Y, y precisamente al enseñar tiene todo el material para la investigación, pero no se, por decirlo en forma muy simple, no se le paga para que investigue y no se le permite que tenga espacios de investigación, casi tiene que pelear por eso, si es que logra un espacio para eso. ¿Cómo avanzar para que la parte administrativa entienda que no son aspectos desligados, sino que el profesor necesita investigar, que sea una parte, no está dejando la enseñanza, sino que también quiere investigar y que no se trata de vagancia de no investigar, pero hay que trabajar y, y debería tener un espacio para la investigación, no como un regalo, sino como parte realmente de su trabajo y que no sea tan elitista. I am so glad you asked that question. Thank you very much for that. Um, so it's interesting because I have exactly the same problem that you described. Uh, I like to do research, I enjoy it, um, but nobody pays me to do it. So I get paid to teach. If I research, it's on my own. I don't get paid for it, so it's a real challenge. Ironically, most faculty members in Canada and the United States are exactly the opposite. They get paid to research, but they don't really get paid to teach, as I was saying at the beginning, and they don't get evaluated on their teaching, so, it's, so they tend to go totally on the research side, whereas I tend to go totally on the, on the teaching side. Regardless, though, of which direction it goes, it's a problem, and you've, you've really, you've articulated that very well. So I think that this scholarship of teaching and learning might actually help to, to resolve those problems. Again, it's a long-term solution, or maybe a medium-term solution. But I've heard through the grapevine that you have senior university elections coming up in about 18 months or so. This would be a really good time for you to start influencing those people who are going to be moving into those positions of higher power and budget control. 
And the way you do that goes back to some of the stuff I said in the lecture. You start talking to the mavens, you start talking to the connectors, and you start building your own networks, and you start using your own teaching and your own research, your own scholarly work, whatever that looks like, to influence those people. So now, see, for me, when, when I'm doing this stuff, usually I'm trying to influence, as I said, either my students or the person on the street, the person in the coffee shop, so that they can understand. And like, for example, I do a lot of work with refugees because I work for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So what I'm trying to do is influence the guy in the coffee shop and convince him that it's okay. In fact, it's, it's a good thing that Canada takes 35,000 refugees every year from Syria. Because that person's perspective is, if we bring in 35,000 refugees, they're stealing my job. That's actually not what happens. So my, I'm trying to influence this guy. So now the question is, and maybe we can talk about this this afternoon, we can do this as a group. <clears throat> not just this afternoon, but in the coming months. Uh, how can we use the expertise in this room to create our own networks and our own scholarships of teaching and learning to influence the people who are going to be in those positions of power who might also be in this room? Is there anybody in this room that fits that? No, I'm not even going to ask. Don't answer that. Don't answer that question. But you know what I mean, right? So we all know, because I mean, I've only been here for 24 hours, and I've already heard that you've got elections coming up in 18 months to choose your, I don't know, do you call it a president or a chancellor, but the, the top person? And then, and then that's, of course, going to cascade down. So how do you influence those people? And then it's their job to influence the people above them, so the government. Uh, whatever your ministry is, whether it's Ministry of Higher Education, probably, and so on. So we could start that process now. But again, the downside to that is it's slow. It takes a long time. Is that okay? Is that all right? Okay, good. Um, so I think that's all the questions for now. But again, please don't be shy. Um, either ask me questions if you see me this afternoon or so on. And, but if you don't, email me, talk to Maynard, talk to each other, please. Thank you very much. Gracias al doctor Aucuin por su conferencia y en agradecimiento le entregamos un obsequio por compartir con nosotros de sus conocimientos y experiencia. El obsequio lo entrega el señor Minor Barrientos. Muchas gracias y en este momento les van a dar algunas indicaciones. Bueno, muchas gracias por, por su asistencia a esta conferencia. Eh, a partir de ahora entramos en un receso para que puedan ir a almorzar. A la una estamos de regreso para la parte del taller de una a cinco aproximadamente. Los que no han firmado la hoja de asistencia, por favor nos indican para que por favor, la, la, la el taller es aquí mismo, ¿verdad? aquí en el Paraninfo. Eh, y bueno, y la hoja, nada más que no se les olvide. Lo de la evaluación, eh, recuerden que hoy, por lo menos los que, lo que tenemos registrado, es que hoy se quedan todos en la conferencia y en el taller, entonces las llenan hasta que concluya toda la, la parte. Y vimos un errorcito ahí en la escala, pero se sobreentiende, ¿verdad?, la parte a donde, pero eso lo aclaramos entonces en la sesión del taller. Muchas gracias.